In section 6.4, we're going to discuss something that uh, is pretty, pretty central to this course. It's the central limit theorem. But on the way, I'm going to do a little bit of review here for you in preparation for your exam this Thursday. So it's going to start this way, reminding you about some notation. For instance, you can calculate the mean by adding up all the data and dividing by n. But is it a statistic or a parameter? What's the difference between a statistic and a parameter? Yes? Statistic would represent a sample parameter for the whole population. Good. A statistic is a numerical calculation based on a sample, whereas a parameter is a numerical calculation based on a population. So basically, you have to conduct a census to get a parameter. Now, how about our notation? What do we use to denote the sample mean? What notation do we always use? X bar. Good. Now, do you remember your Greek letter here for the parameter, population parameter that goes along with the mean? Mu. Let's keep on going. How about standard deviation? What do we use for a standard deviation for a statistic? Mm. <laughs> Good thing we're reviewing, right? That would be S. And your, yeah, sigma. All right, that's cool that you guys remember the Greek letters. Now, this one we haven't really dealt with so much yet, but proportion, that would be, for instance, if I look at the proportion of people wearing hats this morning versus the, the people in this class. So that notation is P hat. We'll see more of that in section 7.1. And then, annoyingly, the parameter is just P. They don't use a Greek letter for this one. I don't know why. How about the variance? If you've got the standard deviation, you should be able to get the variance. So if you know what the standard deviation is, what's the variance here? Anyone? That's squared. And then over here for the variance, sigma squared. Nice. Now, some of these estimators are biased. Some of them are unbiased. Let's look at the, the ones that are, or at least some of the ones that are unbiased. Some of the ones that are unbiased would include the mean and the variance. And for that matter, the proportion. All of these on average, when you're using these on average, they're going to estimate your population parameter. That's what this whole thing is about. You're trying to estimate the population parameter. So when we take a look at our statistics, when we collect the sample mean, we're hoping it's a good estimate of the population mean. Typically, we don't know what the population mean is. It's not practical all the time to conduct a census and get data from everybody to say, oh, well, the average height is this, or the average weight is this, et cetera. That's often impossible. So the best we can do is conduct a, a sample and estimate. So all of these things are estimates. How good is that estimate? Well, we don't know. And that's a little bit of a problem. But there are things that we can do and say about that problem. So all these are estimates. And estimate. Let me list out the unbiased estimators and then look at this stuff about estimating. The biased estimators, ironically, even though the standard deviation and the variance are pretty similarly related, standard deviation is a biased estimator. Not a lot, just a little, but it's a biased estimator. And then a couple that we don't really deal with too much, the sample range is a biased estimator. It tends to underestimate the range. Same thing with the median, that's also a biased estimator. On average, it doesn't give you what you expect. Okay, so that's great. Now let's think, what would be something interesting that you might want to sample? If you wanted to conduct a survey and try and estimate, you know, some parameter of our population, eh, you could do a lot of different things. But let's suppose we're going to conduct a survey and try and sample intelligence. Now, 
Intelligence, it said, has a mean of 100 and standard deviation of 15. So let's click over to our link for Desmos. And let's, let's see about sampling from this distribution. Now this is just a normal distribution. I've drawn it with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. Notice that this center line goes right through 100. The peak of your normal distribution should be that mean, always. And it's a symmetric distribution. Now, I'm going to define being close to the mean as being within, say, I don't know. Uh, see, what do I have shaded here? Um, yeah, being within 5. So plus or minus 5, I'm going to say, you know, that's pretty close. If you took a sample from this distribution and you wanted to get, you know, close to 100, then here's your calculation. You've got about a 26% chance of pulling somebody out of the distribution and getting a value between 95 and 105. Well, all right, but that means you've got almost a 75% chance of getting something that's farther away. And that's not really good. If you're trying to figure out, well, what's, the, what's this mean here? Sampling one person is not going to do too well. So what else could you do? Well, we could sample more than one person, right? You can sample two or three or four. And let's watch what happens. Now, the other day, we saw some, saw some work on drawing more and more samples from a population. Let me see if I can pull up that. Uh, our class notes from the other day here real quick. There was a couple things that happened when we looked at samples of size 2 and 3, 4, etc. And let's see, where is that? Yeah, it's down here. When we increase the sample size, the standard deviation of the sample mean got smaller. So that was nice. That is, you got better and better estimates of where the sample, or where the population mean is, I should say. So that's good. I mean, take a look at taking a, dis, taking a sample from this, this population right here. You take a sample from that and try and calculate the sample mean. For samples of size two, you get estimates that are all over the map. For samples of size 3, you get better estimates. When you take samples of size 4, you get better estimates still. You're trying to estimate the population mean, which is 80. Then what we saw is that for large enough sample sizes, your sample mean itself has a normal distribution. Or if you start out with a normal distribution, like right here, then the sample mean always has a normal distribution. So we're going to start out with a normal distribution. And now we're going to start increasing the sample size. Watch what happens to our probability of being close to 100. That is, you know, somewhere between 95 and 105. So turn on this distribution here. So click that. And let's start moving up the slider here. What if we do samples of size 2? Oh, do we have a better chance of getting a sample mean that's close to our true population mean? Yeah, a little bit. We went from 26% up to 36%. What if we took a larger sample? Let's move up to samples of size 4. Now what's the chance that we get a value from this distribution that's close to our population mean. And by close, I mean within five. Well, if you're rounding to the nearest hundredth place, that would round up to 50%. What's happening when I increase my sample size? What can you say in words is happening to the shape of our distribution? It's getting taller, good. It's getting slimmer, yeah getting slimmer. It's not as spread out. Is there a word that we have that talks about how spread out that distribution is? 
Ooh, bonus points. Thank you, Ethan. Yeah, the standard deviation. Notice that the standard deviation is getting smaller. So where is it that I'm most likely to get a value that's close to my population mean? From the blue distribution or from the orange distribution? Where am I most likely to get a value that's close to 100 if I sample from this distribution? Yeah, the blue distribution for sure, right? You've got about a 60% chance here for samples of size six. And the regular distribution we start out with, I guess it's in red, not orange. But that first distribution, yeah, you got about a 26% chance. And so the more you sample, the more likely you are to get a value that's close to your true population mean. And that's a good thing. If you're spending more effort to get more information, then you want to get a, a better and better estimate of the true population mean. And so let's crank it all the way up. Size 25. And let me make sure that that's in our picture still. There we go. Now you've got a really good chance of getting something close to our true population mean. Now you keep in mind what you're doing here. You're sampling from this distribution right here. You sample, take samples of size 25 and calculate the average. That average has its own distribution, <coughs> which is this right here. So you're no longer dealing with this distribution, dealing with this one. And chances are, in this distribution, you're going to get something close to this population mean. Let's look back at this summary from section 6.3. There's two conditions under which you can have a normal or approximately normal distribution for the sample mean. Now, as a reminder, sample mean is a random variable. That's something that we talked about the other day, one of the conclusions from our work in section 6.3, x bar is a random variable. That random variable either has a normal distribution or approximately normal distribution, depending on whether or not you sampled from a population that was normal or some other population. But for samples of size 30, you're going to have you know, at least an approximately normal distribution for the sample mean. So let's try and do some problems that relate to this. And let's see. That would be your handout here. And let me see. I think I'll show it up on here. I think it'll show up a little bit easier. <clears throat> so this happened a few years ago. There was a boat that was cruising around in uh, some lake in Utah. And it was carrying a lot of passengers, and the boat capsized and sank. And then they looked at things afterwards and realized that the assumptions that they made in determining the weight limits were wrong. We change as a population. We're not as petite as some of the assumptions were originally made. So. Assume that similar boat with 50, 50 passengers, and assume that the weights of people are normally distributed to the mean of 180.6 and a standard deviation of 36.1. Find the probability that the boat is overloaded because the 50 passengers have a mean weight greater than 132. So basically what we're doing is we're updating our standards to a similar, um, similar standard or to a, a modern standard. Let's open up Google Sheets. And I'm just going to open up a, a blank one. Let's get rid of these calculations here. Assume that a similar boat with 50, 50 passengers Excuse me. Assume that a similar boat is loaded with 50 passengers and assume that the weights of people are normally distributed with a mean of 180.6 and a standard deviation of 36.1. Find the probability that the boat is overloaded because the 50 passengers have a mean weight greater than 132. I'm going to split this up into two problems. 
So let's write down both parts of this. So this is going to be example A. And the reason I'm splitting up into two problems is because it's going to look more like what we're going to face on an exam. A. So for the first part, x is going to be normally distributed with a mean of 180.6 and a standard deviation of 36.1. We're going to find the probability that one passenger has a mean weight greater than 32. So we'll start out with that. Find the probability that one passenger, um, probability that one passenger weighs more than 132 pounds. Okay, let's draw ourselves a little distribution just to kind of guide our intuition. What should I label this central line with? 180.6, thank you. 180.6. You don't have to worry about the exact shape of the distribution. Hopefully it's roughly symmetric. 132 has to be over here. Where am I going to shade this distribution? Yeah, I want to find the area to the right of this 180, or of 132. So I want this area all the way to the right. Now we got to be a little bit careful here because Google Sheets doesn't really give me the area to the right. What does Google Sheets give me? Yeah, it gives me the area to the left. So what I'll have to do is find that area and then subtract. So how are we going to find this area? Am I going to use norm distribution or norm inverse? Norm distribution. All right, so it's going to be norm distribution. And then... 132 comma 180.6 comma 36.1 and then what else true for norm distribution you're always going to be using that true thing except we got to do one more thing here we got to subtract it from one now i'll do this in kind of two steps here just to show you what drawing this distribution could do for you, it can help you catch an error. And on the exam, please be expected to draw a label and shade like I have here. You don't have to bring in a colored marker if you don't want to, that's fine. So the first part of this, I'll do equals norm distribution 132, comma 180.6, comma 36.1, comma true. So there's your command, but I want to take 1 minus that. So in the second cell below here, I'll do equals 1 minus, and then click on this cell above. There you go. <clears throat> okay, so about a 91.09 here, approximately. So there's a pretty good chance that one person weighs more than that limit. Now this is kind of building itself up a little bit. Are we okay with this first part of this calculation? Here's what's going to change in the second part, which is really the problem that they ask. That is, uh, assume that the boat is loaded with 50 passengers and assume that the weight's other people are normally distributed with that same mean and standard deviation. We want to find the probability that the mean of those 50 is greater than 132. So we're no longer dealing with the distribution of x. That's this right here. 
That was for the first part of the problem. Now we're dealing with the distribution of the sample mean. So we're dealing with the distribution of x bar for samples of size 50. And here's where your central limit theorem is kicking in. This is going to have the same mean as this one. It's going to be normally distributed with a mean of 180.6. But if you remember, when we were doing our sampling estimates in section 6.3, the bigger sample you take, the smaller your standard deviation was. That's what's going to happen here. The standard deviation is no longer going to be 36.1. It's going to be 36.1 divided by the square root of the sample size. In other words, square root of 50. Oh, okay. So this is going to be a lot less than what it was. Square root of 50 is a little bit more than 7. Let me remind you the effect that that's going to have. So your normal distribution could start out with like something like this. But when you have a big sample size, you divide it by the square root of that sample size, it's going to get much narrower. Its standard deviation is smaller, so you have less spread around the mean. Our calculation, though, is going to be pretty much the same. I will draw it again. I'm not going to try and draw a nice new shape here. I'm just going to draw a regular normal distribution. Uh, let's see here. I still have the same mean, 180.6, 132. Technically, this should be narrower than what I had. But this distribution now is different, and that's going to change the probability. So I want the area to the right here. So this much. But I've got to use this new distribution. So what's that going to look like? Well, it's going to equal 1 minus norm distribution of 1, 132. My Photoshop here. There we go. 132 comma 180.6 comma 36.1 over square root of 50 comma true. So I should get a much bigger probability because this distribution is going to change its shape. It's going to be narrow. It's going to be harder to get down to 130.2. In fact, I think effectively we won't be able to do that. But let's find out. So I'm just going to take and copy this calculation here. Let's put it in a different cell. And what i got to do is i got to edit this. Now I'll give you a couple ways you can do this. You can take this and divide by SQRT. What's SQRT stand for? Square root. Square root of 50, like that. And wow. You're getting zero. So the second part of this would be one minus that. And of course, you're getting a probability of one. Basically, it's 100% certain that the boat's going to be overloaded, is what it's saying. All right. Uh, Carlos? This one? Sure. If you're not really comfortable with dividing that, that and getting a square root or typing in the square root key, the other option would be to just do it on a calculator in terms of uh, figuring out what 36.1 divided, divided by the square root of 50 is. So let's do that here. 36.1 divided by the square root of 50. So if you're more comfortable doing it this way, I should type in about 5.105. 5.1053 if you want. So let me copy this cell and I'll type in 
5.103, and I still get zero. So I'm getting the same thing either way. It's just a matter of how do you adjust for this part right here, the fact that you got to divide by the square root. It's up to you what, whatever works for you. Hmm. Yeah, I knew I screwed that up. Let's get rid of this. There we go. Comments or thoughts on that first one? You know what? We're just going to leave that one here because right now this is a good example of what you're going to face on Thursday as calculating two distributions, calculating two probabilities, one based on a sample size of one, the other based on a larger sample size. By sample size of one, you're just really looking with the normal distribution, whatever distribution you start out with. And for samples of some other size, you've got to divide the standard deviation by the square root of the sample size before you do your calculations. Comments on that one? Let's take a look at example B then. An airliner contains 350 passengers and has doors with a height of 72 inches. That's exactly six feet. Heights of men are normally distributed with a mean of 69 and a standard deviation of, let's see, what is it? 2.8. So let's write that down to get started. Example B, X is distributed normally with a mean of 69 and a standard deviation of 2.8. If a male passenger is randomly selected, find the probability that he can fit through the door without bending. Okay. So, Sasha, what should I label this with? I'm sorry, I was distracted. I have it on paper, it says W. Does it? Really? That's weird. Uh, let's see here. Uh, seven, two. Oh, okay, yeah. I wonder how that happened. Okay, let me change it then. I'll keep, I'll keep consistent with what you have. So, 70 and a standard deviation of 3. All right, no worries. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It'd be the 70. So let's make these numbers a little bit different. All the problem's going to stay essentially the same. So 70 and 3. So yeah, that's going to be 70. Now we want to find the height. Or the, let's see. Let me just double check now. You got me nervous. Uh, find the probability they can fit through the door without bending. So. What side of this 72 do I want to shade? To the right or to the left? Left. Because to the left, those are the people that can fit through without bending. So, yeah, that's the side we want to shade. And that's kind of nice because that's the side that Google gives us, right? Because this is the area in the left tail. So we're not going to just subtract from one like we did with the last one. <coughs> All right, close enough. So I want the area to the left of 50. Who can give me my Google command to do that? Jose? All right, norm dist. Uh, it's not, we're not going to use the 350 yet. So equals norm dist. Yep, 72. And then the mean and standard deviation, so 70 and 3. What's it finish up with? True. So there's about a 75% chance that you can fit through the door. 75% of men, if these numbers are accurate. 
Yeah. So there you go. Up here, there's your command. Norm distribution of 72, comma 70, comma 3, comma true. But now we're going to change things up. And this is exactly what you should expect for an exam as something in two parts like this. Let's take a look at the second part. It says if half of the passengers, half of the 350 passengers are male, find the probability that their mean height is less than 72 inches. So, okay. This one I will try and draw a little bit more to scale. I mean, just a token amount to scale. What's going to happen when you deal with the distribution of the sample mean is that it's going to be narrower. So there's going to be more people or more observations that are closer, that are less than 72 than there were, because up here they're more spread out. Now we're working with a new distribution. <clears throat> so that new distribution would be x is distributed normally. Hmm. Let me zoom out a little bit. All the way for out. What number should I put in here? What's the new distribution I'm working with? Uh, one adjustment there. We the the number is going to be 175 because we're assuming that half of them are male passengers. So yeah. So but you're on the right track. You you're spot on. So this is 70, and then three over the square root of 175. So the standard deviation here is going to get a lot smaller. Because you're dividing by something between 13 and 14, so that's going to be a lot, lot skinnier. I still want the area to the left. And as far as you calculating this on Google Sheets, you can really just copy what you did in the first part and just make the change to the standard deviation. So there's our first part. Let me copy that and take this and divide by square root of 175. Aiden, what'd you get? Yeah, it should be about one. So basically what's happened is that because you have such a large sample size, the standard deviation is, is so small that this is so narrow, it's, it's extremely unlikely that you would ever get anything out here. In fact, it's almost impossible. So that's what's happened here. So this one is equal to one. This one, let me go back and take a look here, put the right number in there. I think it was like 70. Uh, 74.75%, so 0.7475. All right, not bad. Not bad. Are you getting more comfortable with the difference between these two? One's dealing with a sample of size one, one's dealing with a sample mean for a certain size, in this case it was 175. That sample mean has a new distribution. That's the big thing I was trying to hammer home the other day in section 6.3, that the sample mean is a random variable. It has its own distribution, and you need to understand what that distribution is. For samples of size 30 or more, that distribution is going to be normal, or at least approximately normal. On the exam, I generally call this a four-point problem, and this is a six-point problem. I'm putting emphasis on you understanding that second part here, that you need to adjust the standard deviation when you're talking about the distribution of the sample mean. Onwards.
before every flight, the pilot must verify that the total weight of the load is less than the maximum allowable for the aircraft. The aircraft can carry 42 passengers, and a flight has fuel and baggage that allows for total passenger load of 8,000, excuse me, 6,846. The pilot sees that the plane is full, and all passengers are men. The aircraft can be overloaded if the mean weight of passengers is greater than 163 pounds. What is the probability that the aircraft is overloaded? Should the pilot take any action to correct for an overloaded aircraft? Assume weights of men are normally distributed with a mean of 178.5 and a standard deviation of 38.8. All right, so example C. Let's start off by calculating the probability that one person, one man, weighs more than uh, 163 pounds. So let's see what happens there. And I'm sorry, let me go back to this. That's what I was looking for. So our, our population overall is distributed normally with a mean of 178.5. And a standard deviation of 38.8. We want to find the probability that one passenger has a weight more than 163. All right, so let's draw that. So this is going to be your 178.5, and this is going to be 163. We want to find the area, hmm, which tail? Which tail we're going to be looking at for this one? If we're looking for the probability that they weigh more than 163. To the right. So we want to shade to the right. Abraham, what problem is it going to create for us when we calculate our probability? What, what thing are we going to have to adjust for because we're getting the area to the right? Perfect. We're going to have to subtract from 1. Thank you. So when we do our norm disk command, we're going to get the area in the left tail. To get the area in the right tail, you're going to have to subtract from 1. So we'll equal norm disk. Actually, let's, let's do it all in 1. I'll do equals 1 minus norm distribution. Someone want to fill it in for me? Uh, Percy, what would the, the command be for this one? Perfect. Thank you so much. So let's bang that one in or Google Sheets. Equals one minus norm distribution one sixty three point uh, actually just one sixty three comma one seventy eight point five comma thirty eight point five comma true. You could do it like we did up above, where you do it in kind of two steps. So you do say, for instance, this step, and then equals one minus this nothing wrong with doing it in two steps or one step i'm just curious which way do you guys prefer doing one step or two steps one step okay nothing wrong with it the one thing i would say about doing it in two steps here when you look at this answer 38.436 how would i know that an answer of 38.436 is wrong but i just without really doing any calculations i can tell you that that answer is wrong jason Exactly. So to the right of 178.5 is half of our area. Since we've got more than that, our answer should be more than one half. We got an answer that's left than, less than one half. So it's clearly wrong. So then you're like, oh, okay, yeah, I forgot to adjust for the fact that I got to subtract from one. So 
Either way, I'm sure you're okay. Let's move on to the second part. So the first part was kind of invented by me. Second part is actually the, the meat of the problem. Let's see, what is the probability that the aircraft is overloaded? So it's overloaded if the average weight of all these men is greater than 163 pounds. So there's 42 passengers, they're all men, which seems really improbable. But let's take a look here. We want the distribution of the sample mean for samples of size 42. What's that distribution going to be? Try and write that out for yourself. If you're watching this later, then maybe pause the video. Watch it after you've tried to answer it yourself. So I want something like that here. Still going to be looking for an area to the right. Yeah, 38.8. Did I put 38.5 in? Uh, let's see. Yeah, I did. This should be an 8. Thank you. So let's see, there's two things that are going to take place. 
First of all, the mean is going to stay the same, 178.5. And standard deviation is going to be different. What's our new standard deviation? 38.8 over the square root of 42. Now that's going to shrink this distribution. It's not going to be as, as wide as I've drawn it now, but that's OK. 178.5. Do we expect a number greater than one-half or less than one-half? Greater than one-half by a lot. So let me copy this here and just edit it. Eh, let's see, I don't want to do that that way. Let's see. Copy this here. I'm going to edit this command. You guys seem to prefer to do the one minus thing, so I'll do one minus this. But the big adjustment i got to make is divide by the square root of... 42. So about a 99.52% chance. So equals 1 minus norm dist of 163, 178.5, 38.2. 8 divided by the square root of 42 and true. So what do you think? Should the captain take some corrective action about uh, you know how much fuel he's packing or cargo he's carrying? Yes. Yeah. There's a pretty good chance that he's overloaded. You know, that's that's kind of a growing problem in our society. Our, we are changing, and we got to update certain standards like this. Um, there's a problem that the author has in the book about a gondola in Vail, Colorado. And I've been on that gondola. It's very easy with some old assumptions for that thing to be overloaded. So, All right. Let's see. Let's, let's back up for a second. Something I don't think I finished off in problem or example B. So let's take our minds back here for just a second. We found the probability that a randomly selected passenger can fit through the door. And then we found the probability that the average height of 175 passengers, basically half of this crowd is being assumed male, can fit through that door. Which one of these is more relevant when you're designing the height of that door as maybe Boeing would? Which, which probability is more relevant for the safety of the passengers, A or B? I got a vote for B, okay. Thank you, Heather. Any other votes? B works for me. Mm. Now, Let's think about it. Who's going through that door? Is it the average of 175 men, or is it a, you know, one person at a time as individuals? One person at a time as individuals. We don't have somebody who's some conglomeration, some average of those 175 men. So what's relevant in this case is actually part A, because it's going to be the individual that's passing through the door, not the average of the 175 men that pass through the door. I mean, they will all pass through the door, but they're passing through as individuals. So the relevant probability then is for part A. Let's try one last one. Assume that cans of Coke are filled so that the actual amounts have a measure of a mean of 12 ounces and a standard deviation of 0.11 ounces. I can actually see the author measuring this stuff. Um, that's the kind of thing he does. He's very thorough. Find the probability that a single can of Coke has at least 12.19 ounces. All right, so let's copy down a couple relevant pieces of information here. This is example D. For instance, we're going to assume that these, well, actually, we don't have to assume anything. They just tell us that the, the cans are distributed with a mean of 12 ounces and a standard deviation 
So that's our mu and a standard deviation of 0. Point, what was it, 1, 1? All right. Hmm. Okay. Well, are we stuck? Let's see, do they? Well, they really haven't told us that that the distribution is normal here, have they? In the first part. Without that assumption, we can't do this problem with part A. Uh, cannot do without assuming the distribution is normal. Bummer. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Depends on you. Maybe you're like, whew, cool, one less to do. But what about for samples of size 36? What can I say about the distribution now? Am I still out of luck because, you know, my original population wasn't normally distributed? Ethan's shaking his head no. He's right. Why is he right? What's changed now that we're dealing with a sample size 36? Yes. Sample size is over 30, and if the sample size is over 30, then you can then you'll get an approximately normal distribution for the sample mean. So we're dealing with the first part of our central limit theorem. That is, because the sample size is large enough, x bar is going to have an approximately normal distribution. So let's find that probability, x, x bar for samples of size 36 is distributed normally with a mean of what? What mean is going to go there? Natalia? Yeah, it's going to be 12. How about the standard deviation? Perfect, 0 0.11 over the square root of 36. Now, if you wanted to, you could just say, all right, well, that's mean of 12 and a standard deviation of 0 0.11 over 6. That's fine. The square root of 36 works out pretty evenly. So let's find that probability. And basically, that's finding the probability that Coke would give you a little bit more than what you paid for. What do you guess? Do you, do you think that's very likely that Coke's going to give you a lot more than you paid for? Probably not. I'm guessing that this probability is going to be pretty small. So let's see. Example D equals. Give yourself a chance to try and figure out that probability. We want to find the probability that this is greater than 12.19. 12, 12.19 equals
So what area am I going to look for? Am I looking for the area to the right of this or to the left of this? To the right. To the right. I'm looking for the area in the right tail, which would be over here. So that means when I calculate this, I really got to subtract 1 minus that, because right now that command is going to give me the area in the left tail. So it's going to give me everything over here. I want the area in the right tail. Since the total area is 1, I can get that by subtracting, and that probability, I think, was approximately zero, right? Is that what you're getting? Nice. So basically, there's no chance. Coca-Cola is not giving you any freebies. Sorry. So maybe I should just type it in for good luck here. Equals 1 minus norm, norm distribution. 12.19 comma 12 comma 0.11 over 6 comma true and 0. Beautiful. Are you feeling comfortable with these things? These want one more? It's up to you. All right. So by acclamation, that's a yes. Like, yeah, these are really awesome and intriguing. So here we go. Let's bang out one last one. So example E here, <laughs> the weights of M&Ms. Man, you've got to have a really good scale to get down to a ten thousandth of a gram. That's, that's just crazy that you can get something that, that fine here. So example E. Are normally distributed with a mean of point eight five eight six grams and a standard deviation of point oh one oh five one six grams. So x is normally distributed with a mean of point eight five eight six and a standard deviation of point oh five one six. If we find, if we take one candy and select it, uh, let's see. Um, where is it? Hmm. Okay. If one candy is selected, find the probability that it weighs more than 0.8534 grams. So let's draw our distribution and try and find out what we expect. So here's our distribution, 0.8586. And then I've got this value over here, 0.85. It was 34, right? 8534. If one candy is selected, find the probability that it weighs more than 0.8534. Carlos, which way am I going to shade, to the right or to the left? To the right, I want to find this area. What's that going to mean when I use my norm distribution command? Anyone? One minus. Yes, well done. Well done. One more thing here. Uh, what do I expect in terms of a probability? Can anyone tell me anything about what I'll expect? Phineas? Greater than. What do I what do I expect about this probability? Can you tell me anything before I do my calculation? Something I can use to say, all right, well that doesn't seem right. It should be more than one half. Yeah, it should be more than one half. All right. The reason I like pointing that out is because Google Sheets, when you type in that command, is going to give you this area in the pink. It's going to give you the area to the left of 0.8534. 
you need the area to the right. So when you get a number that's less than one half, it should be screaming out at you that, oh, I made a mistake. I need to subtract from one, right? So it's going to be equals one minus norm distribution of 0.8534, comma, 0.8586, comma, 0.0516, comma, true. Here, example E. So as I'm looking at this problem, I'm making a little mental note to myself not to give you something that involves quite so many decimals. One minus norm distribution, 0.8534, comma, 0.8586, comma, 0.0516, comma, true. So about a 54% chance, 0 0.5401. Hmm. So if one candy is selected, find the probability that it weighs more than 0.8534 grams. So that's what it has to weigh in order for the package to, you know, if, if each one of those weighed more than that, then the package would weigh more than the four, 396 grams that it advertises. But we're not just looking at one. We have to look at the distribution for the sample means for samples of size. What was it? 400, 464, 464. So we've got a new distribution. It has the same mean as before, 8586. Eight, this time the standard deviation is 0 0.0516 divided by the square root of 464. I'm having a feeling we're going to get another one of those 100% probability kind of problems. You guys getting something different? Did I type something wrong here? Let me take a look back here. Thanks for speaking up. Let's see, 0 0.8534, 8526. Uh, did you do part B already? Did you divide by square root of 464 no. already? No? Okay. That one works. So are the majority of you getting the same thing I got here, 0 0.5401? Okay. I, I, Kata, maybe you can s swing by and take a look at hers. I did it all in once, and then it, I, I took one minus that. So, uh, are you getting something close, or what's going on? Uh, 0.63. Okay, so what you might want to do is just try typing it all over again. One of the things I'm going to ask you on the exam is to type in your command that you put into Google Sheets. That way I can see what you typed in. And if there's a typo there, you know, I can spot it, and maybe give you partial credit. But if you just gave me an answer and it's wrong, there's not much I can do. So I do try and help you out in that sense. Let's take a look at the second part. So that's just adjusting this part here to divide by the square root of 464. Ah, four. There we go. And that should make this an almost certainty. Well, not quite. I was expecting a little bit more. So in this case, um, yeah, we didn't get quite certainty. Are you guys getting the same thing I'm, I'm getting here? Yeah. Grayson? Um, I can't read what you got there. 0.985025? Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. And also, Aiden, getting the same thing? 
All right, thank you. Yeah, so 0 0.9850. I didn't draw that second distribution, but this is what that distribution would be. I just didn't draw it, 0 0.9850. Comments or thoughts on that last one? All right, let's put this one in the books.